Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate you to the next level in your life. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. God wants to make something out of us. God wants to do uh, something so incredible in our life. Why? Because he created us with a divine purpose. There should be a great meaning to your life, not just exist and, and breathe the air and, and work a job and eat food and go to sleep and wake up and do it all over again. That would be a mediocre type of life. It really would. God created us to be passionate people. God created us to have a purpose to live beyond ourselves. There's nothing wrong with careers and possessions and all those things. I think what, when it becomes an issue is when your possessions possess you, then that's an issue. And so um, when, when we think about following Jesus, he's saying, follow me, and I'm going to make something out of you. It's like this. What if, uh, what if a, a, a billionaire came to you and said, uh, hey, Joni, uh, you know what? I'm, I'm this... Uh, you know, crazy billionaire that has all kinds of money. I don't even have enough life to spend it all. But here's what I want to do. I want you to follow me. And uh, as you follow me, I'm just going to pour all of my wisdom and my insight. And you know what? I'm going to make a millionaire out of you. All you have to do is just follow me. Just come with me. How many would follow that dude? Oh, heck yeah, I would. I'd be like, let's do it. You know what I'm saying? Uh, because I want to I wanna buy a yacht. I want to buy a house. Nothing wrong with possessions once again. But isn't it interesting that Jesus gives you and I, the Christian, the believer, if you say you're a Christian, then guess what? There's, there's, there's a, a structure that we have to live. There's, there's guidelines. There's boundaries. There, there's, a, there's a responsibility that comes with following Jesus Christ. And so when he gives the invitation, he's saying, I'm inviting you to go on this journey where you're going to experience not only eternal life, but while you're on this earth, you are going to transform others as well as I have transformed you. And that's what God wants to do with us. And so um, I'm going to read my first verse. If you use our app, our church app, I have a lot of notes for you today. So um, open that up. If you're not a note taker, guess what? You can become a note taker today for free 99. <laughs> so just download our app. And open it up. I got all kinds of notes there, and you can follow along. But look at this. In this story, Jesus speaks to three different people. One of them speaks to him, and then Jesus speaks to two of them. And here's where we start in Luke 9, verse 57 through 62. It says, as they, who are they? The disciples. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. That's pretty I mean, that's pretty, uh, you know, that's a commitment. I mean, to say, hey, Jesus, I'll f wherever you go, I'll go. And many of us have said that. God, I'll do whatever you want me to do, right? But check this out. And verse 58, so Jesus replied, and he goes all, you know, like poetic on him. He says, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. That dude's just like, dude, I just want to follow you. And so Jesus is speaking to him in these, in these terms, in, in this language, but he's really trying to, to, to let him know what, what he's really asking for because when he says that foxes have dens, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head, what he's really saying is, hey, listen, what you're asking me is simply this. You're asking me that you are ready to leave comfort Huh? To leave Fox Sports on Sunday. Huh? To leave, to leave your, your entertainment, your television. You're saying that you're ready to leave your family, your friends. You're ready to leave anything and everything. Your career to follow me. You're, you're willing to, to give up your soft, comfortable bed and your pillow where you lay your head on to follow me. And so, I mean, that's pretty intense, but stay with me because I don't want you to misunderstand me today. Just stay with me as he, as he shares this. This is Jesus speaking here. And so he says in verse 59, he said to another man, so one said, I'll follow you. And then Jesus says to another dude, hey, you follow me. And now watch this. But he replied, Lord, first, everybody say first. Isn't that like our life too? First, he says, first, let me go and bury my father. 
I mean, how many times do we want to put other things first, priority rather than God? Like today, you came to church, you put him first. That's awesome. But he says this, he says, Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Now, if you read the scripture and, and don't read it with understanding, you would think, wow, man, Jesus is harsh, man. He just wants to take away my life. He doesn't give a rip about my family. My God, I just said my dad is dead. I'll explain to you what he really means. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. What he's saying in this passage is simply this. He's saying, hey, listen, stop looking at your past. When you're so focused at your past, your past failures, your, your past life, uh, the destructive patterns, all that stuff that you've been so focused on, the pains, the hurts, the, you know, the, 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 the daddy issues, the mommy issues, all the things that you've experienced in your past, if you don't let go of that past, you'll never be able to focus and set your face to something that I have for you. And so he's saying, hey, listen, if you're going to follow me, if you're going to put your hand to the, to the plow, then you have, to, you have to make sure that you understand that you're going to have to get your eyes off of yesterday and you need to start putting your eyes on the tomorrow and the future I have for you. That's what he's speaking to the church today. The church is so messed up today. When I say the church, I mean just the church in general. The, 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 the churches around the world, we're, just, we're, 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 we're wanting to follow Jesus until we have to follow him. And so the next few weeks, I'm going to be laying some foundation and what does it mean to follow Christ? What does that look like? Because I'll tell you this right now, following Christ is not easy. It's a challenge. Following Jesus Christ becomes difficult sometimes. You know, it, it's not a popular thing to say that you follow Jesus. Have you ever had a conversation with someone and, and then they start finding out that you're very nice and then, you know, you start sharing your faith and they say, hey, are you a Christian? And the moment you say, yeah, I'm a Christian, it kind of gets weird funky. Have you ever had that awkward conversation? And then all of a sudden they went from them liking you to now they really don't like you very much. It's not popular to follow Jesus Christ. It's not popular to offer prayer. It's not popular to give encouragement through a scripture and say, hey, listen, you know what? Here's what Jesus says. He says that you can do all things through Christ Jesus who gives you strength. They'll look at you like you're funny. And so everyone wants to follow Jesus until you have to follow Jesus. But one of the things in this story that I read to you if you read in the full context, the verses before the verses I just read, what Jesus was saying is, I am determined. Everybody say determined. And as a, as a, listen, as a person in general, if you're ever going to accomplish anything in your life, you must be determined. If you're going to accomplish your career, you must be determined. If you want to be successful in business, you must be determined determined. You cannot expect to be great at what you do in a career and not be determined. There's no such thing. And so Jesus was determined to be purposeful in his life and he was determined to be missional for God because God gave Jesus a mission. He said, I have sent you to seek and save that which is lost, but it's going to cost you your life. And so we understand that when, when Jesus was willing to set his face to Jerusalem, which is really what the Bible was saying, he said he was, his face was set to Jerusalem. Why Jerusalem? Because this was the place where he kept reminding the disciples, that's the place where I will be crucified. Then they're going to bury me. But on the third day, I'm going to come with resurrection power. And no one believed him. Well, he set his face to do the mission. How many of us? have stopped setting our face towards our Jerusalem. Where's your face? What direction are you pointing? Because many times we, as Christians, really lack direction. We lack purpose. Here we have the greatest gospel. Here we have the greatest message in our hands, yet we lack direction of what? God, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to to experience and and see here's here's the thing uh, and I'm a true believer of this I know that the the gospel is very mysterious that's what I love about Christianity Christianity I think the exciting part of being a Christian is that it's a mystery because when God says go you don't even know where the heck you're going 
right? Have you ever had God tell you, go do this? You're like, what, what does it mean? And so the excitement and the mystery of, of following Jesus Christ is this. What if you were to completely give your life to follow Jesus, I wonder what would happen with your life. I wonder what kind of person you would become if you were to completely, I didn't say half-hearted, I'm saying wholehearted, completely give your life to the gospel of Jesus Christ. You can still do your career, you can still do the things you're passionate, but, but in the realm of Jesus being in the center of it. Like the centerpiece of your business, of your career, of whatever you do for a living, if Jesus was the center point of everything. I wonder what would happen with you. That's the exciting part. You see, I never thought I'd be a pastor. I was far away from God. I was a hater of God. I was an atheist. I hated religion. Uh, and, and so then God touches my life and he heals my life. He restores my life. And all of a sudden I start following Jesus. It's been 20 years I've been following Jesus. And as I was following Jesus, I was, I was walking into this unknown territory. It was a mystery because I kept saying, I wonder what's going to happen. I wonder Because he keeps talking about purpose and, and calling. And I'm like, what's my call? But you know what? Sometimes, you know what? You don't have to focus so much on the call. You just need to put... And set your face to Jesus. And then as you face Jesus, as you walk with Jesus, as you follow Jesus, you begin to discover your divine purpose in this life. And that's how I found the fact that God says, Mauricio, what you thought you were called to do, which there's nothing wrong to have a permissible will, right? means that God will give you permission to do what you want to do as long as it's godly. But I want to have his perfect will for my life. Not permissible. His perfect will. And his perfect will only comes when you follow Jesus Christ. That's where you discover it. And this should be exciting because some of you right now, okay, yes, you have a career once again. But I'm telling you, there's something more than just your career that God wants to do with you. There's more. There's an excitement that comes with following Jesus. There's a passion that comes with it. And that's what Jesus is, is saying to his disciples. He says, follow me and I'm going to make you into something different, something that people will look at and say, man, it's kind of like the disciples. They followed him for three and a half years. Do you know what? The Pharisees who were very well educated, they were, they were so great in their theology. I mean, they went to the best of the best of the best of the best theologian schools and all that. And when they saw the disciples, you know what they said about them? They said, man, aren't these, aren't these dudes, these uneducated and untrained men and they're doing all these great amazing works I mean they're doing some great stuff and they're saying man these are these are those average Joes and they're 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 not nothing special I mean why would Jesus pick average people everyday people to do big things for God because even though they knew them as uneducated and untrained they said this but we cannot we cannot Go from the fact that they've been with Jesus. When you're with Jesus, you do things that you could never think that you or imagine that you can do. I mean, you can do some amazing things with Jesus. I've had people tell me, man, what, what, what university did you go to? I didn't go to one. Why do you know so much about business? Why do you know? Because you know what? I'm passionate about learning. And you know what? A disciple is a learner is a student. And so what God wants to do is as we're going with Jesus, we're growing with Jesus. As you're going with Jesus, you're growing. But when you're not going with Jesus, you're not growing. And the, and the, and the challenge is this, is to have and see Christians that can be more mature to be Christ-like. We sang that song, right, Scandalous Grace. Man, I want to be more like you, Jesus. I wonder if that's really the cry of our heart. Because we sing it like, man, I want to be like you. Da, da. And, you know, I forgot the other lyrics. And just to know you, blah, blah, right, right. And so we're like, yes, and we're doing the wave. And, you know, you're just, yeah, yeah. And then we get back out there and we flip off another person out on the street because they cut us off. <laughs> I want to be like you. <laughs> right? So God's saying, hey, listen, I want you to go from spiritual moments to a spiritual lifestyle. God wants to mature us. God wants to grow us. But that growth only comes when you set your eyes 
or set your face to Jerusalem. What's your Jerusalem? What does God want to do with your life? I wonder what if you were to completely follow Jesus. I wonder what he would do with your life. What if? Because it's all about a what if. What if? What if I just started being more serious about my walk with God? What if I started being more serious about reading my Bible? What if I started being more serious about my prayer life? What if? It's a mystery. It's the unknown. I mean, that's what faith is. Faith is calling those things that are not as though they were. It's, it's, it's the evidence of things hoped for. What if I would completely give my life to him? Huh. I remember back in the days, um, I've been in ministry. I've been walking with Jesus for 20 years. <clears throat> but, you know, the church I come from, they used to make us wear suits. And it was sometimes like, it was kind of weird because we'd go to beach baptisms and we'd be wearing suits in the beach. You know how awkward we looked? <laughs> We're doing baptisms in suits. Yeah, what's wrong with you? Just a little weird, just right there, suit. And I used to wear suits all the time for every service. And, uh, and my son Isaac, uh, you know, he was this little guy, two, three years old. He was uh, always watching, you know, me, whether I was doing announcements or, or preaching or something. And he would always just, just be looking at me. And, and you know what, he got so intrigued that he would go home and he would grab his little, you know, uh, picture Bible. And he would begin to, like, you know, he couldn't even speak for lick. You know, like he can put sentences together. But he'd be like, blah, blah, and just saying all kinds of craziness. But he was reading his Bible. It was awesome. You know, I'm like, yeah, that's amazing. I love that. Two, three years old. Well, you know what, he just kept becoming more passionate about Jesus. Because our kids, they grew up in church. Listen, our kids, they grew up sleeping on on. on Church chairs, under the chairs, on stages, in hallways, in offices, in bathrooms sometimes. They just grew up in the church. It's what they knew. It's what we lived. It's all, it's all we know. We were, our face was set to Jerusalem, right, to do God's call. And so as Isaac kept growing up, he started, you know, being more passionate. And he would pray like his dad because when I pray, I'm passionate when I pray. And so he'd walk around and, and do the same things. And, and then one day he finally said, he's like, Daddy, I want a suit like you. And so we went out and we bought him a little suit with his little tie. But it was funny because, you know what, the moment we put a suit on, he just kind of went from this little crazy boy to like this little kid was like. <laughs> and we're like, Isaac, you look so, you look, man, you look sharp. He's like. <laughs> and, you know, had this whole look of just kind of like. You know, just, just kind of feeling like, wow, you know. And you know what he would do? Then he would grab his little Bible and he would start preaching. He would sit Alexis down and say, you're the, you're the church, you're the audience. And then he would preach to her. Ah, and Alexis would be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they'd be playing with each other. And then they would do plays about the Bible. Why? Because we, we came from a church that was very big on creativity and, and plays and drama and music and everything. And so what my kids saw, they did. And so they would have these moments of all kinds of stuff. And you know what? My son became so passionate uh, in his prayer life that they called him. His nickname was the prayer warrior. And so anytime we would go to intercessory prayer, he would pray for people, like adults. He'd be like, can I pray for you? And people would be like, okay. And then he would start prophesying over them. You know what? He would do amazing things. He would lay hands on people. If you sneezed around Isaac, he would lay hands on you and pray for healing. And so he was known for the prayer warrior all throughout the church. And then the pastor one day said, hey, can your son open up in prayer for us on Easter Sunday? And I said, sure, I don't think it would be a problem. I'm like, hey, Isaac, would you like to pray? Yes. No, no problem saying yes. He loved it with his little suit and everything, you know, up there. And he got up there and he prayed his heart out. And let me tell you something. It's amazing to see how our kids, both our kids, have followed the example of their mom and dad. As we are following Christ, they were following us. But now, as they are getting older, now they follow Jesus. Because now, obviously, my daughter is 22, my son is 18, and now... They are following Jesus. Listen, I was my son's hero. But now Jesus has become his hero. Here's, here, here's what I want. If you're a note taker, write this down. What does it mean to follow Jesus? Number one, it's watching everything Jesus does. It's watching everything Jesus does. My son would just watch everything I do and then he would mimic me. He would copy me. Number two, it's. It's watching Jesus every move. So he saw what I did and he did it. 
And then he saw how I moved. And let me tell you something. So when Isaac would pray, he would move and then move and he would move around. Why? Because every move I made, he made the same move. God is saying, I want to create a movement inside of you. You see, when was the last move of God that you created? You see, I believe that God wants to see a generation, a church that is enthusiastic. I believe that God wants to raise up a church that is missional, but also that is outrageously just radical and passionate for Jesus. I believe that God wants to give every single one of us a pioneering spirit where we are the pioneers of a new movement. And that can happen at home, at work. That can happen in the mall. That can happen in a coffee shop. That's why we're doing these different type of hangouts, like the motorcycle club thing. That is going to focus on reaching souls while we're looking cool and like a gang. <laughs> so we're going to get off the bike, look all gangster, and be like, hey, do you want to know Jesus? Right? <laughs> But we're also on the same day. You know what? We're going out there and they're doing an event called uh, Elevate Your Aim where they're going to go out. And I love what Frank said. I love he just did it so well. In a very safe environment, we're going to shoot guns. You know, I love how he added that thing because normally we get emails from people. They're like, what? I can't believe the church is shooting guns. But um, don't email me, please. I won't respond. But uh, there's, there's, there's a purpose behind everything we do. It's not just, hey, let's go have fun. I, I don't hang out with people just to hang out. I just don't do that. I hang out with people because we're being missional together. And we have fun at the same time. I make fun of you and it's cool. It's awesome. <laughs> but, but that's what Jesus says. Jesus says, hey, listen, I want to place a spirit, not just any spirit, a pioneering spirit where you can say, you know what, I started something. I started something. Yeah, La Carlos is the leader of the motorcycle club. But one day I said, hey, La Carlos, we should start a bike club, do something. Guess what? You know what? He saw me. I led it last month with him. Now he leads it this month. And so what are we doing? You know what? We're pioneering new things, new ways of reaching people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? Look at this. Paul says it this way. I love it. There's, listen, there should be no, no, no excuse to tell people what Paul said. He said in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, follow my example as I follow the example of who? Christ. So there shouldn't be a, a shame when you tell people, hey, listen, follow me, follow my example. And as you follow my example, you're going to basically be following the example of Jesus Christ. What Christ does, I do. Jesus said this. He says, you know what? I only do what the Father shows me. Even Jesus said, I only say what the Father tells me. And so Jesus was yielded to the Father. What the Father did, he did. And so what is God saying to us? God is saying, I want you to have the same spirit, a pioneering spirit, where you can also pray for the sick, where you can bring a message of hope, where you can bring a message of deliverance, where you can be the kind of person who's not afraid to go in a hospital room where someone is sick and dying and declare and proclaim that Jesus is going to revive, Jesus is going to heal. God is just looking for someone who would be willing to believe him and trust his plan. Are you hearing today? Follow my example as I follow the example of Jesus Christ. Write this down. Jesus intends for our life to have movement and progress. That's his intention. His intention is to create a movement and progress. And so now I see my kids, they have movement, they have progress, and now they're saying, I want to do what Jesus did. Because if not, you will live like the crowd that never left the shore. What do you mean, Pastor? Yeah, you're just watching everybody launch. You're just hanging out on the shore because it's safe. Because when you launch out into the deep, you never know where God's going to take you. You never know what God's going to do in you. But you have to trust his plan because here's the truth. The truth that it is not easy to be a Christian. It is difficult. It is a challenge. It has its lows. When you follow Jesus, it comes with pain. 
It comes with betrayal sometimes. It comes with, with, with hurts. But let me tell you something. Don't just get stuck there. That's, that's, that's real struggle. I have a real struggle, pastor, but I also have a real God. And so, but the gospel, when you follow Christ, it's also a great reward. It's amazing. It's supernatural. Man, God will do things that will just leave you like, oh, my God, dang, that God, you're so good. I have seen people in comas where the doctors have said, that's it, it's too late. They will be brain dead. And as I have obeyed God and as I have gone into hospitals where they said they won't make it, but then as I just show up and I just show Christ, God does amazing things. And people that were, that were told by doctors, they'll never wake up. And if they do, they'll be a vegetable who are now alive and living. All because I'm just willing to follow Jesus Christ. Just follow him. God will do amazing things. You'll also be on great highs with Jesus. There'll be great benefits. What are my benefits? There'll be provision. There'll be healing. There'll be restoration. There'll be forgiveness of our flaws, our sins. There'll be, there'll be complete healing of our brokenness. God wants to do something amazing, but will we follow him? Will we truly follow him? I wonder what kind of life you would have if you completely followed him. I wonder what that would look like. Today starts Elevate Life Tracks. We call it Elevate Life Track because we want to get your life back on track with God. And, and we teach what it looks like to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And so hopefully you would want to do that. Let me read you a true story. I used to read this book to my kids when they were little. This was their bedtime story book. And I know that a lot, I remember people used to get upset at me. I didn't care. Because it's a book on martyrs. Christians that were willing to give their life for Jesus. And every night they'd be like, read us a bedtime story. I'm like, okay. And I'd bring them the martyr book. Everybody, while everybody else is reading the, you know, My Little Pony and, you know, Where's Waldo? I'm reading How to Die for Jesus. True story right here. This is a book of all the stories of people who have given their life for Christ. And uh, this is a young girl, young girl uh, in mainland China during the communist uh, time of, of China, during the, the Red Guard era, which was around 1966 or something like that. This is a Chinese girl refused to betray the secrets of the underground church. So we know that in China, um, there are many underground churches and that's the only way to have church. If someone finds out that you're a Christian, they rat you out and then they come and they give you a chance to renounce Jesus Christ or die. I wonder how many of us, if it was a crime to be a Christian, would probably forfeit our Christianity. And so she wasn't willing to, to give up the location of the underground church. And this is, and even though she had been tortured again and again, she was asked how she could bear so much suffering. And she said, it was not hard, she replied. I had been taught by my pastor that the real torture lasts very little. For one minute of torture, there are ten minutes of glancing at the enraged faces and the implements of pain. I decided to keep my eyes closed the whole time. I did not see the stick before it hit me or afterward. The suffering was much reduced. I relied on the promise of Jesus when he said, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. I purified my heart of the fear of men and I learned to see God. When the communists became aware of my defense, they stuck my eyelids open with tape. But it was too late. My vision had already taken on a new aspect. And I had seen God as so many had seen him before. I wonder how many of us are at the place where no matter what struggle, what circumstance, no matter what individual would come to you and tell you there is no God or who tries to take your, your faith, your, your theology, and all of a sudden begin to confuse you 
and, and then you start double thinking and, and taking maybe double steps back and saying, maybe, maybe I need to be open and maybe this is not. Listen, when you have experienced Jesus Christ, when you have followed Christ, you will say what this girl said. It's too late. You can't, you can't take me out, devil. It's too late. You can't take me out, problem. It's too late. You can't take me out, cancer. It's too late. For I have seen God. It's too late. Close your eyes, lift your hands to heaven, and I want you out of your own heart to say, it's too late. I follow Jesus. Amen. Put your hands down now, okay. So what is God saying? He's saying it's time to live beyond yourself. Stop being so confident of yourself. And start putting more confidence on God confidence. We'll call it Godfidence. Get some Godfidence in your life. Are you hearing me today? Okay, so what's the term Christian mean? Okay, what does that look? Look up on the, the term Christian simply means this. Yeah, you're a little Christ. It's like Isaac. Isaac was a little Mauricio. That's what they called him. Little Mauricio. They, you know, even now I get confused with Isaac. People sometimes think I'm Isaac. And sometimes they think he's me. But it also means follow after Jesus. Are you following after Jesus? Are you following after Jesus? Because for three years, these average disciples, these uneducated and untrained men were not only changed by Jesus, but he transformed their life so extreme that they changed the entire world. Twelve men changed the world. I wonder what would happen to the church of today if people would take their walk with God serious. I wonder how many more Billy Grahams you would have in this generation. I wonder. It's not too late. You're not too old. You're not too young. You're not too ugly. You're not too pretty. You're not too skinny. You're not too fat. Jesus is just looking for someone that will follow him. Just follow me and I'll make you. Man, I just think you don't know what God will do with you unless you step out into the great unknown. You will never know until we step out. Tap two people and say, step out. Because mystery is what gives. Listen, it's mystery that gives, that gives the gospel excitement. I wonder what's going to happen today. Look at what Paul said. I love this. Because part of our following Jesus is also growing in character. Because you can't be like Christ but not grow in character. We cannot be like Christ. We can't be little Christ unless we start allowing Jesus. Here's what it looks like. Well, what, what are you saying? How do you grow character? Well, God has a spiritual chisel. And he wants to chisel your character. And the chisel will put a sizzle back in your life. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, sizzler got nothing on your sizzle. I'm just rapping now. Wiki, wiki, right? Ephesians 4.13 says this. Paul said this. Look, he says, hey, this will continue until we are. What will continue? You're growing. Listen, growing spiritually is not automatic. Growing spiritually takes time. There's a process of progress. That's why we have Elevate Life Track today at 12 o'clock. You want to grow up? Go to Elevate Life Track. You want to you really want to take your your walk with God to the next level? What are you committed to do? What are you willing to determine yourself to grow in Jesus in 2017? It's not too late. And so he says, this will continue this growth until we are mature, just as Christ is, and we will be completely what? Like him. And isn't it hard to be like him? It's so difficult to be like him. Okay, can I read you one last story? One last story and let's, go, let's get out of here. One last story. So in Matthew chapter 14, you have a story of Jesus going through pain. And I want to talk to you because uh, I think sometimes when you follow Jesus and you experience any form of pain, like maybe a loss of, of, of a loved one, a child, a, 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 a parent, a husband, a wife, um, 
anything that, that created a loss. And, and through that loss, now you have pain. And so Jesus puts these stories in the Bible for the purpose of letting you know that when you follow him, hey, listen, you're going to have pain sometimes. But as you keep following me, there's a way to, to relieve the pain. And there's one who can heal your pain too. And so in this context of this story that I'm going to read, John the Baptist, who is Jesus' cousin, who was baptizing people for the remission of their sins, has just been arrested. He's now arrested and he's in the hands of King Herod. King Herod is afraid to kill him and martyr him because he was afraid of the people that were following John the Baptist. He was afraid of having a backlash. And so he just left him in prison. And so now... Here you have uh, this woman that Herod is dating. I think her name is Herodias or something like that. Uh, she had this daughter uh, who was very beautiful. And she knew how to uh, uh, engage men in, in dance. And who knows, maybe it was strip dancing on a pole. I don't know. But, but the scripture reads like this. It says that, that as she danced, that King Herod and his guest, it says that they were so amused. And he said, you know what, girl, for dancing, I will give you half of the kingdom. You just keep dancing, girl. You just keep doing your thing, and I'll give you half of the kingdom. Whatever you want, I'll give it to you. And the mom who hated John the Baptist because of his righteousness and because he was calling out her sin, she got all ticked off, and she said, you know what, you tell him what you want is the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And so she said, I want his head. Bring it to me. And, and King Herod was like, oh. But because he had already given his word in front of all these people, he was not going to look like, like a fool and, and, and not go on his word. Because in those times, man, if you, if you didn't do that, you'd lose reputation. And so he did. They cut off uh, John the Baptist's head, who was the first martyr in the Gospels. And they brought it and so forth. And so check this out. So Jesus... Listen, he came as, 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 as human being. He, he felt the pain that you and I feel. He wept throughout the scriptures. He was in sorrow many times in the Bible. He experienced rejection. He experienced betrayal. He experienced all kinds of things. There's nothing that you and I have experienced that he didn't already go through. He's a relational Jesus. You can relate to his life and he can relate to yours. And so look at this. So that's setting you up. Matthew 14, 13 through 21, and we're done. It says, when Jesus heard what had happened, what happened? John the Baptist was martyred, okay? It says he withdrew. But say he withdrew. So obviously, you don't just withdraw. So they told him, here's what happened, and he just, ah. Uh. It says he withdrew by boat privately. In other words, he just said, hey, listen, guys, I know that you guys are following me, but listen, I just need to get away from a second. So he withdrew, and it says he went privately to a desolate place or a solitary place. You know what that means? When you read the verses in the Bible that, where it says he withdrew himself, it simply means that he went to pray. He went to pray. And the disciples knew, hey, man, when he says he's withdrawing himself, we don't go with him. That's his time with God. And it goes on to say uh, he went to a solitary place. And then hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. And when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had what? Compassion. So he's trying to get away. Have you ever been that Christian where you're going through crap, but then the coworkers are looking to you for answers? Have you ever been in a place where you're going through so much pain because of something that has been so traumatic to you, but people are still pulling on you? They're wanting your help. They need your presence. Have you ever been in that place of pain, but there's still people trying to get a piece of you? And Jesus was compassionate in the midst of his pain of his cousin named John the Baptist. And he says, and he had compassion on them, and he healed their sick. As evening approached, the disciples came to him, and they said, this is a remote place, and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. But Jesus replied, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. That's like you coming to me saying, Pastor, Pastor, I need you to come and pray for my family. I need you to come and pray for my friend. Listen, I don't mind that, but there's not enough of me for all of you. And that's like me looking at you saying, no, you go pray for them. See, that sounds pretty harsh, huh? 
but it's really not. Jesus is saying, if you're going to follow me, then you need to follow my example. Don't get mad at me. Some of you were going to ask me to go with you today, huh? You're like, dang, why do you have to say that, man? Because God wants to use you. Why? Because you'll never know if you step out to the unknown. What if you went and prayed? I wonder what would happen. What if you went and you delivered? I wonder what would change. <laughs> you give him something to eat. Verse 17, we have heard only five loaves. We, we only have five loaves and of bread and two fish. And they answered. Uh, and, and he said, bring them here to me. Come on. And I love this because this is kind of crazy. See, when you hang with Jesus, man, he's going to ask you to do crazy weird stuff, okay? So stay with me. Nobody moving around. And he directed the people. Everybody say he directed the people. So, so they're like, man, Jesus, all we got is two fish, five loaves. This is all we have, man. This is, this, send them away. And he says, no, give them to me. And he, looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and he broke the loaves. And then he gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the people. So basically he, he told them all, hey, everybody, sit down in 50s. And the disciples are like, no, 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 don't sit down, don't sit down. He's playing. Just, just get back up, get back up. That's like some of us sometimes, God wants to do amazing things, but we, we kind of like, we, 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 we don't want to take the prophetic word that he's trying to give us. You know, because why? It's too deep. It's too, that's too supernatural. That's too wacky. When you follow Christ, he will do supernatural things in your life. And others may not understand it, but as long as you understand it because of your intimacy with him, he will bring the awe of God back into you. And she's so like, yeah, everybody, sit by 50s, 20s, 30s. No, 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 April Fool's, he's messing. We got no food. We got two fish, five loaves, man. And you know, he's tired. <laughs> you know, he just, his, his, his cousin just died. He ain't thinking straight. <laughs> what do you do? But check this out. So then he blessed it and then God multiplied it. In verse 20, and this is this, and they all ate. And we're what? What is the same? Until you follow Jesus, you will never be satisfied. You won't. There won't be anything in this life that will satisfy you like Jesus. You can have all the money in the world to buy the most expensive bed on planet earth, but it won't get you a good night's sleep. Jesus is the only one that can give you rest. When you have a cancer that is taking your life like I did, Hodgkin's lymphoma, when you have a 10 by 10 inch mass that is pressing against your, your, your nervous system like mine and was in between my heart and my lungs, you know what? No one could help me. But because I followed one and his name is Jesus, who I chose to believe that he can take a natural situation like that and do something super on my natural and then have a supernatural healing. That's how God works. Because if you can't accept the supernatural of God, then you're no different than the disciples when they're saying, no, all we got is two fish and five loaves. Jesus says, I'll take all that you have. I'll take the little. I'll take whatever you're willing to let go of. And hold on to me. <laughs> Last points. Let's get out of here. Following Jesus means this. Number one, we withdraw. This is what comes out of this verse. We withdraw for one reason only, okay? We withdraw so we don't give up. You know how you do not give up when you're a Christian? You pray. Why? Jesus always withdrew to talk to the Father. The Father always brought him strength to keep going. He didn't give up. I think that people who have a porn issue, alcohol issue, uh, I don't think it's a lust issue. I don't think it's a, 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 an addiction issue with, with, uh, with alcohol or drug. You know, I, I really believe that there's the difference between escape and withdrawing. And most people escape by watching porn. Most people escape by drinking a bottle. More, most people will escape to do drugs. What are you trying to escape from? The pain. So you find an escape rather than dealing with the pain. 
And he's saying the only way you deal with pain is you have to learn how to withdraw. You learn to withdraw in order to get with God so that you don't what? Give up. Number two, quickly, we are satisfied when we? We're satisfied when we? When you let go of your life, then you can hold on to the new life he has for you. When you let go of your life, let go of what you want, then you can embrace what he has. Number three, pray outrageous prayers that do the impossible. We got to come back to that place where we're going to pray crazy prayers. Crazy prayers because Jesus prayed some crazy stuff. He got the two fish, five loaves, and it says, and he looked up to heaven and he said, Father, bless it. If today's message impacted you in any way and you would like to help us spread the gospel to others by giving a financial gift, please text the number below and we know that someone's life will be changed as yours was today.